test, test, test. louder. Turn it way up. Test, test.
Okay, today we have as our speaker at Grand Rounds, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Graham. Graham, Dr. Graham, uh, <laughs> sometimes when Okies go west, sometimes we found some things, found some gold in California. Well, this California kid uh, migrated the other way. Uh, went to Vegas, uh, got went to medical school uh, and our school there, then went to, came and found his way to Joplin. Was in the only hospital that then get carried away by the <coughs> tornado. Uh, survived that, came to Tulsa, did a rotation with us, and when I first met Jeffrey, I was so impressed. Said, you know, you gotta stay around here. Maybe you ought to think about a fellowship. We got a program coming on, so. He hung around and uh, we were so delighted that he said yes and uh, he's a part of one of our GI fellows. We're very proud of Jeffrey. He's gonna talk about today about liver lesions. So as you talk about working up people with cirrhosis and things, this is very important. Don't forget about liver lesions. So Jeffrey, make us all smart. Okay, thank you for the good introduction. <laughs> now let's see if you guys can't see the black can. can I can, but can you? That's the hardest question of the day. I can change the color if you can, or not. Well, I'll go on. So key points of this lecture that I'd like you to figure out are when you see, or frankly, patients will frequently come to you with a diagnosis of something is in the liver. Um, once that occurs, you either be a, um, abdominal pain in the ER, if they're admitted and they have abdominal pain, um, I'd like you to know key points to focus on when you interview with patients. Um, liver lesions can come in all sorts of forms and help you. I'd like you to have an idea of how to come up with your final diagnosis. Um, if you suspect there may be a liver lesion, someone that's not diagnosed with any masses, figure out, uh, have a good way to exploit your resources, meaning if you have a lot of imaging available, you have good radiologists, um, good interventional radiologists that can help you um, devise a care plan ultimately get a diagnosis. So important points to take during history are like others, of course, um, you need to know the patient's age because that will help you determine what, or help you determine what's in a more appropriate differential. The sex of the patient's important. Um, men and women have different degrees of risk factors for certain liver lesions. The history of oral contraceptive use and or um, anabolic steroids in men either the geographic residence or travel history. I know that's becoming more and more popular in today's world with the incidence of Ebola rising. Uh, we're, we're more apt to ask the questions of travel history today. I'm reminded of the importance of that. Um, other, other illnesses that may already be diagnosed or established will help us point the dire direction on where to go on our differential. And always important, especially for our radiology team is to know if any imaging has been done before, so we have a good comparison to help determine a timeline. And that helps you sort out whether a lesion may be benign or not. So, for instance, if a patient presents to the ER with abdominal pain, and chances are it's not usually the liver if it's a slow growing mass. Liver pain always comes from stretching of the glistening capsule which surrounds the liver. And itself can either represent two things, either a rapidly growing infiltration of the of the liver itself and stretching of the capsule and or um, a single mass that could be stretching inside the liver. The pain is usually described as dull, kind of a vague pain that's not really positional, it never really goes away. It's persistent. It can change um, with respiration um, due to the diaphragmatic uh, irritation with the movement up and down of the diaphragm. And of my own note, um, of course, it, you can generalize this for all pain. Um, patients do well when dilated, and when they have, especially when they use metastatic pain. And of course, um, you can get referral pain to the right surgeon. So important re, um, things to discuss in the past medical history are have they ever, or do they have a recent viral exposure? That could be any of your hepatitis, um, known history of alcoholism. That th these would point you down a trail of cirrhosis. Um, cirrhosis is more likely to lead you to cases of hep hepatocellular carcinoma. And therefore, knowing the prior toxic insults to the liver would be important to know. Um, NASH is, is probably becoming an epidemic, 
obesity in this country is fairly popular, or common rather, and I think we're going to be seeing a lot more patients diagnosed with NASH and or history of cryptogenic neurosis. Autoimmune disorders are rare, but do occur, um, as well as metabolic disorders. Hopefully by the time they hit adult age, being 17 for most internists here, um, then metabolic disorders would have been described such as Newman Pitt. And so if they show up and they have known cirrhosis, um, always be on the lookout for their um, constellation of signs, which include ascites, spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, but also be, are they being admitted for bleeding in esophageal barracks, or are they encephalopathic? Um, from liver. Okay, so knowing when you, when you meet them and do your initial uh, physical exam, it's important to note temporal wasting, um, spider angiomas, which typically well visualize on the chest, palmar erythema, which I have all the time and I don't think it's new to you, um, ascites, um, that is frequently seen on all imaging of the abdomen, um, known splenomegaly, which is a consequence of portal hypertension, caput medusae, which actually comes from the recanalization of the umbilical vein. Um, hepatic brewery, if you're astute enough to catch one, that will frequently point towards cirrhosis as well as signs. So does anyone know what these are? Exactly. How about that? I know I'm bad at hearing, but not, not that bad. Anyone? There you go. How about that? No, that's B.O. So important laboratory testing um, to consider um, with a CBC, frequently cirrhotics will, will have thrombocytopenia, and that's due to portal hypertension and sequestration of platelets within the spleen. And they frequently have anemia, either iron deficiency or of chronic disease. Hepatic panel, it's important to look at the ASD ALP just to see how the transaminases are doing. Bilirubin can be important. Um, it basically shows a timeline of the overall liver condition. Um, some liver failure will be out the, out the roof, but um, it may actually point towards an obstruction, which can occur with liver masses themselves. Um, knowing your synthetic function of your liver is also important. It's important to screen with a hepatitis panel. Um, patients are frequently, more frequent than not, um, hard to nail down on whether or not they've been at risk for hepatitis and or they don't know the risk factors and then just go over the risk factors with them and do an ear interview. If you have a known mass to visualize, um, tumor markers are valuable um, as well as an LDH if you're considering lymphoma or more rare if your urine is 24 hour 5-HIAA listed or So for imaging, important to consider your image um, source and the provider as because it specifically with ultrasound, it varies significantly on the operator. But you can frequently, it's usually the test of choice because it's non-invasive and it's inexpensive. CTs, it's nice to specify, not all CTs are created equally, um, a quadruple phase or sometimes called triple phase, uh, dynamic CT basically, um, times the dose of the IV contrast and helps enhance liver lesions and helps the, actually the radiologist point you down a road towards diagnosis. And MRI is also fantastic. You get a pretty good picture with MRI, dedicated MRI of the liver. So as you can see in this picture um, from left to right, you can see the liver lesion change throughout your different contrast periods, phases. This is an MRI, and the reason I chose this picture, this is actually, wh what does this liver look like? You can really see good detail. It looks nodular, um, and that's, that's an excellent picture. But it, 
basically goes to show the details that you can get off our engine that we have available to us. And same, same with this. So this, with the MRI, you can do your phases, and you can see the different enhancements of the same mass with different phases, and that has to do with the puffer cell. Um, and here they are. So within the liver itself, there are more hepatocytes than cuffer cells. The neat thing about cuffer cells is they, they're macrophages, and they take up the contrast. So when they take up the contrast, they, they, they hang on to the contrast a little differently than the hepatocytes. The hepatocytes dump the contrast, so you actually get a difference in the retention, and it helps the radiologist really lead you down a diagnosis. You can look it up if you're an intern and whatnot, but frequently on the reports, they'll give you a fairly good differential, which is quite helpful. But because it's helpful because there are different things to do for different liver shapes. For instance, these, this list of liver including the cavernous hemangioma, um, focal nodular hyperplasia, cysts, um, focal fatty changes in the liver, and angiolipomas. These are things, if, you, if you, this is your diagnosis, you don't have to do any further workup. You're benign. Whereas um, these lesions are typically benign or um, not problematic, but can. So hepatic adenoma does have a, a small percentage of converting into carcinoma. Biogenic liver abscess, if they're sick, that may need to be addressed. Um, may not, but usually with antibiotics we do. Um, nodular regenerative hyperplasia um, can be addressed. Um, inflammatory sugar change, cysts. So these are the malignant lesions, which are certainly brighter, broad range, but the most frequently found liver lesion is a metastatic lesion. You can get primary hepatocellular carcinoma but frequently if you see cancer within the liver itself, it's from somewhere else. Um, cholangiocarcinoma goes to the liver. Sometimes it's a mixed picture. And sarcoma. Also lymphoma will be on this list. So for pyogenic versus amoebic, these are good pictures that show the distinction, um, but you, you may get a pyogenic that's walled off. I believe you guys talked about Aspects of liver folks. So starting with pyogenic, this is a nice picture showing an actual air fluid level within the lesion itself. Um, frequently males get them secondary to exposures. Um, they are most frequently found in the right lobe and also diabetic. The patient will often present with Charcot's triad, and I listed that for you. There's also a renal pentad, but these are the most frequently um, the fever, the right upper quadrant vein, and the jaundice. The jaundice will occur usually from um, compression of the biliary system, preventing drainage of the liver. Abnormal em liver enzymes will be found, so of course, if there's jaundice, your bilirubin ribbon will be up. Weight loss, again, right shoulder pain, and um, single ulcer of Douglas tube, and that's from this irritation. So a biliary tract can be caused, a biliary tract pyogenic liver abscess can be caused by an obstruction shown in the um, common bile duct. Um, you also get, if you have thrombophlebitis, you'll have um, reduced blood flow or hematogenous spread, meaning you have, let's say, for instance, endocarditis. The infection can seed elsewhere, direct extension from cholecystitis as well as trauma. Any ideas on what iatrogenic causes a, a pyogenic liver abscess may be? So if you, had, if you had an owned tumor and you ablate it with RSA, you basically have an empty cavity. That cavity can be a nice place for bacteria to, to thrive. So usually they are polymicrobial. You usually get gut four, including Klebsiella's number one versus E. coli. You get two different strands of strep are high on the list. If you have gram positive and gram negative to worry about. And sometimes you'll get negative culture. What do you do with them? You just drain. Yeah. So treatment. So if, if on your imaging, if you note that they're less than five centimeters, uh, five, sorry, five millimeters, go ahead and you can do usually a CT guided, CT guided drainage of the of always culture. 
it's neat to be able to culture before you start antibiotics, uh, which is not always practical. A patient comes in the ER and it, it looks like it's called a pyogenic liver abscess. It'd be neat to be able to get that, that sample. That way you know what to discharge them on. So if they're not toxic, there is there is some ground for them to use when they get a, a drink to do it sooner rather than later. Um, if it's a bigger lesion, you'll go you'll be obligated to inclined to flush it daily or multiple times a day to keep the bacteria abscess itself flushed out. And always use broad spectrum antibiotics. That's what I was talking about when it comes to discharge. If you don't know what bug it is, because now you started them empirically in the emergency room, you drained it, now it's sterile. If you don't know if it's sterile because your broad spectrum antibiotics started in it were, were effective, or if it was always just a sterile uh, collection. And that's our decision to err if we're going to leave the collection sterile. And there are two things to consider. If, if, it's, if, you, if the drainage and the IV antibiotics aren't helping, you can consider ERCP if it's close to the main duct as well as off surgical drainage. Because sometimes they don't go back, and these people are committed to quite a long course of IV antibiotics. Here's a nice picture of that. Dr. Drew Leithart from Brown Clinic. So amoebic abscesses. This comes with world travelers specifically. Anyone know what bug is the most common? Amoeba histolytica. Anyone remember that? And males get it uh, on a ratio of seven to one. So they'll frequently present with malaise, um, just general running down, as well as high fevers, weight loss. Interestingly, on their purple smear, they won't have any smooth epithelium. Um, if you're astute enough, try to check the, the stool for cysts. You can also check serology. You can get serology on the stool as well as the blood for an amoeba histolytica. And I don't know what, what the turnaround time would be if you would have started them on something like flagell when they hit the door. Um, but that it'd be, it'd be neat to be able to, to catch it and get your answer. The problem with that page is, so it's actually the cysts. And I think this was the sec first or second year of med school. It talked about the, I think the goats, some sort of goats and whatnot. And need the cysts and to go through and that's that's the problem and they colonize the area they colonize the cecum and they go up to the portal center system and they go back to the liver and this is of course another right lobe and the left so think of when you hear when you talk about travel um, it's important to know what where areas are endemic and it's just not u.s or western world when you think of africa asia south america So the problem with these is they do pop. And when they pop, you can, they can go to along the pericardium. That's why on the, when you have, if you do have a left side lesion, it's more important to address really soon because you need to get the pericardial spreading as well as the perineum. Occasionally they can go external. There's a big abscess. And if you look at the volume of that compared to that, that liver and cross section, guys can see that. I don't know how well you guys are with blur. So this is important. So if someone comes in with an EVA um, abscess, the dose of your flagell is more than your standard 500. Okay, it's 750 PID. So that, that's important to know. Um, you can also use idoquinol. Um, drainage is not always necessary. It always is with the, on the left side, but um, consider draining if they're not responding, if they're getting toxic. Uh, if it's large, you need five centimeters is your cutoff, and of course, toxic. And I don't know, some t the, in, in the reading, it, it talks about in, in, impending rupture. I don't know how you can see that, I guess, if it looks tight. Then, unfortunately, you need hepatocellular carcinoma. So anybody with a diagnosis of 
of cirrhosis coming into you. If, if you don't know why they're cirrhotic, it is interesting to figure out why they're cirrhotic. What was your exposure? Was it alcohol? Was it alpha-1 antitrypsin? Did they have autoimmune hepatitis? NASH. It's rarely used to see. Hepatitis B worldwide is a huge cause of cirrhosis. Um, for hepatitis B patients, they do not have to be cirrhotic to become change into a hepatitis, I'm sorry, a hepatocellular carcinoma. Keep that in mind. So if you have hepatitis B, you do not have to have cirrhosis to develop a hepatocellular carcinoma. That's why the screening guideline for hepatocellular carcinoma is different for Africans. Africans from Africa, true. So um, if there are any, any of them greater than 20, then you can screen for increased HCG. Asians are more apt to develop HCG as well, and they do have a difference in age. So Asian men is 40 for Asian women is 50. Hepatitis C is very common in the US at epidemic levels. There's a lot of news on this because of the exciting treatments that are now available. But, and the importance to treat the hepatitis C is clear, and you can, if you can reverse, if you clear the hepatitis C virus, you can them against um, hepatocellular carcinoma, and there's no better cure than prevention. Um, hemochromatosis also carries a high risk, but that's not nearly as high risk. One, hem people with hemochromatosis are likely to, more likely to develop HCC, but when you're looking at the numbers, there are a lot fewer patients with hemochromatosis that have viral hepatitis C. So following the, the AASLD guidelines, um, these were updated last year, 2011, any of you followed their changes from 2005, they did change a little bit. So you do a, a scan on a patient and you see a lesion and it's, it's the only, it's a solitary lesion. If it's, if it's less than one, one centimeter or less, you follow up with another trans abdominal ultrasound. If you find nodules that are between one and two, then you go ahead and do a, a dynamic study such as CT or MRI with contrast and the radiologist tells you it's hepatocellular carcinoma, you do not biopsy it. Do not pass go, do not flush it out with dollars. You got your diagnosis, which is interesting because you will frequently see patients getting biopsies when they may not necessarily need it. So it's a, and that's specifically it's a large, it's a, the tumor itself is greater than one centimeter. You can also, it's also, they also change the guidelines regarding the alpha beta blister. So now they reduced it, used to be greater than 400. Now if it's greater than 200, biopsy is not required. Okay. Um, the guidelines in 2005 were talked about using um, an ultrasound with air, air contrast, and that's no longer a viable option for, for this because it wasn't enough to get it. So if you do go ahead and biopsy it, now what? And it's negative. Now you, you, you've committed this group to follow up CTs every three to six months. So it's hard, sometimes these patients can fall through the cracks, but it's important to get them on a schedule. If you, if, especially if you know this is something that is probably gonna happen. So hepatocellular, hepatocellular carcinoma can come in many forms. It can, can come as a solitary mass, multiple lesions, or as well as diffuse. And there's a nice picture of diffuse. So you, you go ahead and image their liver, and the liver is just packed with it. It's usually a, a fatal diagnosis at that point. D stage the liver, T1, T3. Um, if it's a single lesion without any involvement of the, the blood supply, it's T1. If it's greater than five centimeters and a single lesion, it's T2. And, or multiple lesions greater than five centimeters or with um, vascular invasion. And this is important because it comes down to, can you cure it? Any idea how you would cure, hepat I'm sorry, yeah, hepatocellular carcinoma? Bueller? Transplant, they need the liver. So that's what they're considering doing in this town now is, is the idea of doing liver transplants 
go ahead and if you say you can cure cancer, that's good marketing. So locally receptible is rare. Usually they present too late. Okay. Um, more common is um, locally advanced and unrecyclable vascular involvement. So this is what I was talking about, how being a consequence to lot, the, a fatal consequence to be diagnosed this late. Your survival goes down to two to four months if it's metastatic liver. So that's a pretty short period of time to be in remission order. There's only one treatment available um, chemotherapy-wise, and that's seropinib. Okay. There are also local treatments that you can use. Um, one is RFA, so that's radiofrequency ablation. Other one's chemoembolization, which is um, or percutaneous alcohol injection, going back to pyogenic liver abscess. So let's say you had a patient with hepatocellular carcinoma, you go ahead, do the right thing, you do chemoembolization. Now you have a, an empty void in the liver that can later get infected. So that would be unfortunate that you have a cirrhotic with hepatocellular carcinoma. Now they have a pyogenic liver abscess where they're drinking on long, lifelong antibiotics, potentially, and no longer chemotherapy is available. And then, so it's, it's nice to be able to cure your causes. So if you can prevent hepatitis C from turning into hepatocellular carcinoma, you can save them potentially from developing hepatocellular carcinoma and getting a transplant. Hepatic angioma. That looks like a fish. So hemangiomas, pretty, really pretty in the past. So you see peripheral enhancement, which is you, fortunately, radiology is able to call these for you, so you know not to stick them. More imaging, this is more ultrasound. Cross-section, see, see how the blood supply, you can see how vascular these are. Why would you want to address these? What's one reason to address one of these? Like maybe they bleed or they pop. Here's, here's non-MRI. And this goes to show the difference in contrast with the difference in imaging and being able to interpret what is actually blood on an MRI. That, that thing lights up. So I guess the good thing is they're usually asymptomatic, um, but they are prone to, when they get symptomatic, they are more likely to bleed. I mean, that's your concern is having a, a ruptured hemangioma. Hepatic adenoma. So who gets hepatic adenoma? Anyone in here on birth control? on birth control. Mm -hmm. uh, oral contraceptives, I guess there are other forms of birth control, but just for those people that don't know. Um, so the portal tracts and hepatocytes and these things, man, they pretty nice circumscribed. Yeah, they need to be taken care of. Usually they're solitary, but you can get multiple. And they're not, they're not, there's no capsule involved. So I, I don't think they're, there's no fibrous capsule. I don't these are also underneath the gleason, so these can cause pain too when they grow. See, vascular response to estrogen surge. This is your oral contraceptives, as well as anabolic steroids. Pretty chilled around. Um, then your more rare glycogen storage diseases can continue, and hopefully it, these would be diagnosed by the time you see them. It's harder to find. And then typically this is, is a woman, and that's because of the, the estrogen. that nice cross section it looks like it's stuck on so here, here's some numbers for you so oral contraceptives give you a five time increase over the five years so if anyone's been on oral contraceptives over five years you are at risk 25 times higher after nine years so that's in our age group 30 40 you could easily be on oral contraceptives 
with us that long. These can turn into cancer. If they do present with right upper quadrant pain and they see this, it's something to definitely be concerned with. Right. And mortalities, 25% mortality for tender pain. It's not zero. It's about a head and shoulder. It's too late to get into it there until later on. But in, anyway, they're hypercoic on ultrasound. And I, I, anyone ever do a tectum team 99 scan for these? Yeah, but they would be cold. So the treatment and stop with your oral contraceptives, of course. And if they are symptomatic or you think they're gonna bleed, of course, with a 25% risk of mortality, then you have to go ahead and finish the surgery on board. Because they do turn into cancer. So focal nodular hyperplasia. Okay, this is a growth in which, the, and they, so you, someone has focal nodular hyperplasia. The best way to think about it is when you do your biopsy, it's gonna show no uh, normal tissue. The problem with it is it's not organized tissue. So that's where you get your abnormal imaging. So yes, so the focal nodular hyperplasia does have portal tracts and bile ducts within it. Usually found incidentally, usually asymptomatic, but this is someone that presents for something else. You go ahead and scan them. If you see something, a fascinoma in the liver, this could be on your differential. Very little potential for hemorrhage, uh, no malignant potential. There's not been any deaths reported since the last night. So it's up to the doctor and what he decides. So these have a very I have a picture coming up of the central stellate scar, which helps in radiology and help you with the diagnosis. It's not cancer, it's swelling capsulitis. So up to 30% have a stellate scar, which I don't know if it's pathic or clonic, but it, it is helpful. Bi biopsy if you, if you don't know if it's focal and central nodular hyperplasia. But in, if someone is in, looks kind of like a starfish,
What's the potential for? Hi. <laughs> What's the potential for regenerative medicine? Is that something that we're educating the regenerative medicine field, or is it something that we're thinking to actually teach medical students? First thing they have to tell us is to stop all that stuff. So they can't really do it. So we can't do it. So we can't. We don't know the consequence. A lot of it comes down to not knowing the consequence. But a lot of these new surgical innovations can cause consequences. If you see a ball sink that failed or somebody on the runway, <laughs> it's not something you can go to a guideline book and say, you know, you can Google. You can try to Google some side effects of this medicine. since they're not really, really studied in modern first-degree medicine, no one trusts them. It's newer, newer research in this field, so that's for sure. Um, I know a lot of those pathways, the hope is to divert um, the metabolism of drugs from the stunt using them, and in theory, that sounds really great, but it's actually going to work. basically toxic insulin. So you have a toxic insult for the liver. You get from a virus, poison, that Tylenol, the alcohol, the, um, we're worried, and this has not really been um, high fructose corn syrup, but is this causing fatty liver, which is going to influence your gut to switch? That's not published yet. But the potential for getting some of the alcohol that once you because get more of it, so you go ahead and fit, <laughs> yeah, well, it's going to be. You're saying how many the potential for the it's, You know, you go ahead and you can extrapolate it and say if someone has a broken neck, it's just the light, but they're still the one that broke it in the first place. Right. Yeah, and that's where the ethics and from the financial standpoint of our government, resources being allocated, we have a patient who is, we're treating them, curing them for hepatitis C. Today, the oral therapy for hepatitis C is right around $100,000, up to $150,000. So you have a patient that went ahead and thought of not having enough money to have hepatitis C. You give them 150, you allocate $150,000 to cure the disease. Cure the disease. They go out and use it again. Well, you do, so yes, you do have that population that may be able to insult the liver over and over again. And that, now you're getting to the ethical question. Do you go ahead and prevent them from being treated? I have my opinion. Whatever's causing the insult, be it food, behavioral therapy, um, virus, you know, do they get a blood test routine? Uh, do you cure that? Do you cure the hepatitis C, and then they go and decide benzene should be never in there? Because these are these are things that you're never going to be able to control, realistically. You're going to get calls from the board. Let's say they go ahead and do the behavioral therapy. Well, does that mean they have to be compliant? Just because you go to Alcoholics Anonymous does not mean you have to be drinking. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and so we all we all know what we're supposed to say to get out of trouble.
work out for you. 